Here's a question. If you lived in a city, in a place like Russia, far from the native range of elephants, and you know there's no zoo in town, and you also know that the circus has come to your city to perform for a few days, and you're walking down the street, and you see an elephant in the middle of your city, what is your first hypothesis? A, that that elephant must have escaped from the circus, or B, that that elephant somehow trekked to your city from its natural home thousands of miles away and went completely unnoticed by everyone along its route. Obviously, B is thoroughly absurd. But when it comes to the origin of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, we are being asked to believe such an absurd hypothesis. Let's go back to 2011. In that year, a researcher by the name of Yoshihiro Kawaoka, working at the University of Wisconsin, performed a controversial experiment. He and his team modified a strain of avian influenza so that it could infect and pass between ferrets. They chose ferrets because their respiratory system closely resembles the human respiratory system. This type of experiment is called a gain-of-function experiment. What that means is they give a virus a new capability. In this case, the function that was gained was the ability to infect and pass between ferrets and therefore human beings. Gain-of-function researchers will sometimes take pieces of other virus species and splice them into their target virus in order to give that virus new capabilities, such as adding the binding domain from a virus that does infect humans to a virus that does not, thereby giving that virus the ability to infect and pass between humans. When the scientific world heard of Kawaoka's experiment, there was a huge outcry. In fact, publication of his paper was delayed because there was a fear that terrorists could learn about his technique and use it to create a bioweapon. In 2012, the New York Times warned of an engineered doomsday and called for an end to gain-of-function research. At about the same time, a group of 200 eminent scientists formed the Cambridge Working Group to lobby governments around the world to outlaw gain-of-function research. One early and vocal proponent of gain-of-function research was Dr. Anthony Fauci. Fauci is the head of the NIAID, America's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is a department of the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH. In 2011, Fauci and two co-authors published an op-ed in the Washington Post in which they argued strongly in favor of gain-of-function research. Despite Fauci's efforts, in 2014, the Obama administration put a moratorium on all gain-of-function research. Keep that date in mind, 2014. From that point onward, American agencies and researchers were forbidden from engaging in or funding gain-of-function research. While all of this was going on, something happened in an abandoned mine shaft in the town of Mojiang in Yunnan province in southwestern China. Six miners were working to remove bat guano from the shaft when all six of them fell ill with a severe pneumonia-like illness and three of them later died. Doctors recognized their illness as a viral pneumonia. And what's clear about this virus is that it's highly virulent because it killed 50% of those who contracted it. But it's not very transmissible because none of the people caring for the miners contracted the same disease. One of the physicians treating the six miners suspected that the virus in question was a bat-borne coronavirus. And he notified Dr. Shi Zheng Li, who is China's leading researcher on bat-borne coronaviruses, which has earned her the name the Bat Woman. Dr. Shi obtained samples of the virus that had infected the miners and brought them back to her place of work, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, located in Wuhan, China. The Wuhan Institute of Virology, or WIV, is China's only level four biosafety lab, meaning it's the only place in China that can legally perform gain-of-function research. There, she and her colleagues sequenced the virus, and in 2013, they deposited their data in GenBank, which is a worldwide database of genomic sequences. They named this virus BatCov4991. Back in the United States, in 2014, Dr. Anthony Fauci's NIAID, under the NIH, decided to fund a study 
that involved gain-of-function research on bat-borne coronaviruses. The rationale for the study was this. By better understanding coronaviruses, we could create vaccines to protect against them. The study summary clearly indicates that it will involve gain-of-function research. The organization that Fauci chose to conduct this research was the EcoHealth Alliance. The EcoHealth Alliance is an NGO based in New York City. It's run by Dr. Peter Daszak. Daszak is a British virologist based in the United States. Here's Peter Daszak talking at a virology conference in Singapore in December of 2019, before the official start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Coronavirus is a pretty good, I mean, neurovirologists, you know all this stuff, but they, you can um, manipulate them in the lab pretty easily. It's yeah. just spike protein drives a lot of what happens with the yeah. coronavirus, uh, zoonotic risk. So you can get the sequence, you can build the protein, and we work with Ralph Barrick at UNC mm -hmm. to do this, um, insert it into a backbone of another virus right. and do, do some work in the lab. In this case, the lab in question was the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The EcoHealth Alliance subcontracted their gain-of-function research on bat coronaviruses to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the team of Dr. Shi Zheng Li. Despite the fact that the American embassy in Beijing had sent cables to the State Department warning that the WIV did not have a sufficient number of properly trained personnel to carry out this dangerous research. And despite the fact that the U.S. government had put a moratorium on research like this, the NIAID continued to make payments to the EcoHealth Alliance to conduct this research after the start of that moratorium in 2014. In fact, they made five payments in total after that time. In 2017, Xi Zhengli and her colleagues published a paper on bat coronaviruses. In the funding section for that paper, she clearly lists the grant that was given by Dr. Fauci's NIAID to Peter Daszak and the EcoHealth Alliance to fund gain-of-function research into bat coronaviruses after the United States government had explicitly forbidden such research. And then, in the fall of 2019, in Wuhan, China, something happened. In January of 2020, Western media started carrying reports of an outbreak of a mysterious pneumonia-like illness in Wuhan, China. It was almost immediately understood that this illness was very similar to the 2003 SARS-CoV-1 outbreak, which was caused by a coronavirus that originated in bats found in southwestern China. Being the leading Chinese researcher on bat-borne coronaviruses, it was natural that Dr. Shi Zheng Li would become involved. In February of 2020, Dr. Shi and her team published an analysis of the new virus that was plaguing Wuhan. And here's where things get very strange. In that paper, they say the new SARS-CoV-2 virus is 96% identical to a bat-borne coronavirus that had been found in Yunnan in southwestern China. They don't say who found it, where, or when. And they give no reference to the virus in question. They refer to this previously discovered virus as RATG13. And this is where a team of internet sleuths took over. This team, known as Drastic, poured over publicly available virus databases and found the previously discovered virus that she and her team were referring to as RATG13 was BatCove4991, which none other than Shi Zheng Li and her team had deposited into GenBank in 2013. So what's going on here? Why is Shi Zheng Li and her team trying to hide the fact that they had been working with the closest natural relative of SARS-CoV-2, the same virus that had sickened those six miners in Yunnan? Here, you can see that RATG13, BATCOV4991, shown here with the blue line, is nearly identical to SARS-CoV-2 shown here with the yellow line. There's only one point on its sequence where RATG13, BATCOV4991, differs significantly from SARS-CoV-2. Or, put another way, where SARS-CoV-2 differs significantly from RATG13, BATCOV4991, its closest known relative. It's over to the right side of the figure, where the blue line dips noticeably below the yellow line. 
This is the area of the sequence that codes for the spike protein, the part of the virus that allows it to infect human beings. When virologists inspected this part of the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, they noticed something very unusual. In fact, it stood out like a sore thumb. There was an insertion of four amino acids, RRAR, that was not present in the original SARS-CoV-1 virus or the RATG13 BATCOV-4991 virus. To the trained eyes of a virologist or evolutionary biologist, the sudden appearance of this sequence looked distinctly unnatural. It bore the unmistakable imprint of human activity, which stood out clearly against the patterns created by natural processes. To their eyes, this new virus was obviously a chimera, that is, a biological entity formed from two or more separate species. And just what is this 4-amino acid insertion? It's a foreign cleavage site which allows the virus to infect any human cell containing foreign. Essentially, a foreign cleavage site is a key that allows the virus access to a huge variety of human tissues. And it's precisely the kind of thing you would add to a virus to make it much more transmissible to human beings. Now, there are those who would argue that the foreign cleavage site arose in this virus due to the processes of natural selection, despite the fact that foreign cleavage sites do not appear to confer a survival advantage in viruses that populate bats. To argue that a perfectly arranged foreign cleavage site suddenly arose in this bat virus is essentially arguing in favor of the infinite monkey theorem, namely that a monkey, given an infinite amount of time, would eventually type all the sonnets of Shakespeare. There is, of course, a much more parsimonious and reasonable hypothesis. So you can get the sequence, you can build the protein, um, insert it into the backbone of another virus. In order to explain the odd features of SARS-CoV-2, some argued that the virus originally colonized an intermediate species, perhaps a pangolin, at the Wuhan wet market. But many of the original cases had nothing to do with the wet market, and the Chinese CDC has rejected this hypothesis. And scientists have now said that it's impossible that the pangolin could have been an intermediate species. And despite a desperate, year-long search for a viable intermediate species, no such species has been found. So we are left with a choice between two conflicting hypotheses. A. SARS-CoV-2 was created in a gain-of-function experiment by Dr. Shi Zheng Li at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, with funding from Dr. Anthony Fauci's NIAID via Peter Daszak's EcoHealth Alliance, despite the fact that the American government had put a moratorium on such research. Shi Jing Li used gain-of-function techniques to turn a previously weakly transmissible virus, RATG13, BATCOV4991, into a highly transmissible virus by adding a receptor binding domain containing a foreign cleavage site, most likely drawn from another species or custom designed in her lab. The virus escaped from the lab due to the lax safety protocols that the American embassy in Beijing had warned about. And now we are all paying the price for Dr. Fauci's arrogance. The fact that he ignored the opinions of his fellow scientists, broke American law, and contracted a dangerous lab to produce a virus with the capability to kill millions. That's hypothesis A. Here's hypothesis B. A virus found only in bats that live over a thousand miles away from Wuhan suddenly underwent a miraculous mutation to give it a binding domain that it has no need for in its native environment. And that bat infected a person who somehow traveled all the way to Wuhan without infecting another person along the way. Despite being infected with this new hypertransmissible virus, or that virus species down in Yunnan jumped from its natural bat host into an unknown intermediate species. And that intermediate species managed to travel all the way to Wuhan without infecting anyone, and then managed to infect the population of Wuhan before vanishing completely from the face of the earth. Common sense, reason, and all the evidence point to A as the obvious explanation for SARS-CoV-2. But perhaps you favor the second hypothesis. In that case, you probably also believe in flying elephants.